What's going on, buddy? My name is Albert, and welcome back to yet another SCP React Reunion. Today, we are checking out an SCP I've been curious about for the last eight years. And I've never truly been able to find a really detailed video on it. But thank you, Dr. Bob. You have answered my call. This is SCP-513, a cowbell. I don't know anything really about this SCP, but only if you shake it, it causes some sort of like hallucination creature to start following you around after you hear the sound. That's literally all I know about this. I don't know the backstory. I don't know where it was found. I don't know anything else about this except for those details. But this is an SCP I've been wanting to look into for a very long time, so I'm not going to waste any more uh, time on this. I'm going to check it out. And like I said, this is made by Dr. Bob. So... We're going to go check this out, and Dr. Bob does not disappoint me. So we're going to start this in three, two, one, boom. It's the grisliest crime scene the detective has seen in years. Photographers wince as they capture it all in a succession of quick, stark flashes. CSI technicians do what they can to pick up the broken pieces. Posted at the gate, a rookie doubles over and throws up, while his older partner gives him a sympathetic pat on the back. He can't hide his own discomfort at the things they've seen today. The call came in the middle of the night from a pair of concerned hikers on the outskirts of town. They were halfway through their nightly walk down an old country road when they heard screaming from a nearby farm. When officers finally made their way down to the farmhouse, it was too late. Everyone there was dead, nobody to save. All that's left to do is pick up the pieces and figure out what the hell actually happened. The detective okay. leans under a yellow garland of crime scene tape and asks an attending officer what they know so far. The cop, who looks pale and clammy, swallows over a lump in his throat and says, Looks like the old farmer snapped and went postal. Whole family's dead. We found his body in the barn. He heads inside to take a look at the carnage. It's a veritable house of horrors. The farmer's wife Ugh. is dead in the kitchen. The children were both murdered in their beds. Oh, the, the detective children. can't say he's ever seen a murder done in such cold blood. So detached. For a man with no history of violence to do something so terrible to his loved ones for no reason. The detective shakes his head and walks upstairs, sliding on rubber gloves to avoid contaminating the scene. He goes room to room, making fastidious notes about anything suspicious. He's got a keen eye for this kind of thing. The man's a 20-year veteran of the force. He's seen mm. some terrible things. But as he lays his eyes on the bodies of the victims, he can't help but feel a chill tiptoeing down his vertebrae. In the master bedroom, where the now deceased farmer and his wife once shared a loving marital bed, he hits some pay dirt, a diary in the bedside cabinet. He flips through. Early on, it's all mundane, scattered thoughts for the day at hand and little to-do lists for the next one. But the last three entries contain a marked shift from what came before. The first one shift reads, thought. He seemed shook up when he came back from the barn today. He's awful quiet about it, said something like, I heard something I shouldn't have. In the barn? Don't know what that could mean, but I decided not to press. Stressed enough already. He didn't say much to the kids during dinner. Kept looking over his shoulder. Freaked me out something terrible. I don't know what did it, but whatever it was, it put Hold a on. scare in him. I'm sorry for kind of just disappearing like that for the moment, but we're back and we're let's get right back into it. He didn't say much to the kids during Rewinded dinner. Rewinded a few Kept seconds. Looking over his shoulder. Freaked me out something terrible. I don't know what did it, but whatever it was, it put a scare in him. The second reads, I'm starting to worry about him. It's been a few days since whatever he heard in the barn, and he ain't gotten any better. In fact, I think he's getting worse. He won't shower. Something about the bathroom mirror, he just won't go in there. He hasn't been eaten. Worst of all, he doesn't sleep. I'll wake up in the middle of the night and see him sitting bolt upright, staring at the bedroom door, not saying a word, not even blinking. The third and final entry reads, This ain't the man I married anymore. There's something wrong with him. It's scaring the kids and it's scaring me. He started bringing his gun to bed every night. Doesn't sleep, just sits there with it. Jeez. He never sleeps. When I asked him what's happening, he told me something's coming. But it's okay. He won't let it get us no matter what. I don't understand. I'm going to take the kids and go stay with mom for a few weeks while he works this out. But I'm afraid of what he'll do if he realizes the gun is always loaded. The detective sighs and slides the diary into Eesh. an evidence baggie. It was, sadly, a tale he'd heard all too many times. 
mm. the terrible things we can do to the ones we love when we're not ourselves. Though it now seems cut and dry, a mental break snowballing into a massacre, one detail is still gnawing at the detective. What did the farmer hear in the barn that day? When the detective enters, he orders everyone else to leave. He needs some time alone in here. As the people file out, he approaches the farmer's corpse. He's laying in the straw, head a bloody mess, bludgeoned beyond recognition. And yet, he's the one holding the bloodstained hammer. And in his other hand, he's clutching something even stranger, a rusty old cowbell. Of all the things to be holding in your last moments on Earth, the detective thinks as he reaches Don't over. Don't bring it, man. Something about you the bell so draws his eye. For. Why, after murdering his entire family, would a man head out into the barn and, presumably, try and fail to hammer a cowbell to pieces? As he picks up the bell, he runs his gloved fingers along the rust. Other than the wear and tear of age, the bell shows no signs of actual damage. It's such a strange, innocuous object. What's the significance? His internal musing is interrupted when a large spider, the kind that like to make their homes Ugh. in straw-filled barns, suddenly crawls out from inside the bell and onto the detective's hand. He drops the bell, an involuntary shock reflex, and it hits the ground with a brassy gong. The sound lingers in the air for far longer than it should. It seems almost like it's getting louder. The detective feels his heartbeat speeding up, his breaths getting heavy and labored. The sound gets louder. It feels like someone is sitting on his chest. He falls to his knees, scratching at his swelling throat. His heart pounds. Is he having a heart attack? He claws at the dirt and straw beneath him, trying desperately to get a handle on things as the world around him seems to go dark. The toll of the cowbell gets louder and louder. Eventually, he's able to force out a scream and collapses to the ground. When his eyes open, he's being carted away on a stretcher to a nearby ambulance parked just outside the crime scene. When a paramedic <laughs> asks him if he's okay, the only thing he can stutter out through his dry mouth is, don't touch the bell. Don't let anyone touch the bell. The doctor who treats him will later tell him there are no signs of any physical ailment. In all likelihood, the detective had experienced a severe anxiety attack. When the detective tells the doctor that he has no history of anxiety attacks and that this is far from the first violent crime scene he's encountered, the doctor purses his lips and knits his brow in concentration. Very strange, the doctor says. Perhaps just take it easy for the next few days. Work stress can sneak up on a person, especially in a career as high stakes as yours. It can sometimes manifest in rather strange ways. <laughs> that night, the detective is at home, brewing himself a soothing cup of herbal tea on his doctor's recommendation. He's still racked by a strange uneasiness from earlier in the day. You see, one of the keys to being a good detective is pattern recognition. You're able to detect obscure links between pieces of information that other people, in the stress of the moment, may not correlate. As the detective True. sips his tea, he remembers the first entry in the farmer's wife's diary. When the farmer's downward spiral started, it began with him hearing something he shouldn't have inside the barn. The detective doesn't know a lot about what happened to himself in that barn either, but he can safely say he heard something he shouldn't have heard too. He sighs, no point in psyching himself out like this. After all, it's just the post-attack jitters. And No, it isn't. I'm afraid this man's gonna die. <laughs> turns to his kitchen window. He seems like, he's like one of my out at the night favorite sky characters so feel far. A little more the other SCP ones I've seen Instead, from Bob. He sees something out of a nightmare. A tall figure standing behind him, somewhere in the ballpark of human, but also somehow not. It's tall, fleshy, and emaciated. Its face is too smooth, with bulging eyes and a large mouth being the only features. It reaches for him with huge, spindle-fingered hands, mere centimeters away from the back of his head. But the second it sees him looking at it, it turns and begins to run. The detective's mug falls and shatters on the ground. He turns with an involuntary yelp to track the creature, but it's already gone. His kitchen is empty and silent. Of course, one question haunts his mind. What the hell just happened? He's no fool. He knows the mind can play funny tricks on you. After all, who hasn't seen something out of the corner of their eye that gave them a momentary fright before realizing that it was just a trick of the imagination? But this wasn't just a flicker playing on a paranoid mind. The detective would swear on his mother's life that he truly saw this thing, some bizarre humanoid monster standing behind him in his reflection. He doesn't know which possibility scares him more, that there really was something behind him or that he's starting to lose his mind. Either offered a number of frightening possibilities, 
but the detective does what he does best, applies logic to a situation. He'd spent the day around a particularly distressing crime scene, read something unnerving in the diary of one of the victims, and suffered a panic attack in the barn. All of this was just a suggestion implanted in his mind, connections being threaded where they shouldn't, a natural side effect of a brain wired to register patterns in strange data clusters. The detective does his best to remain calm for the rest of the evening. Oh, here comes Fear this music. Whenever this killer. music comes, panic only happens. ever makes a situation Something worse. Something epic always happens. These are both things horrifying. he believes, but he can't seem to shake that creeping feeling of dread. He's being watched. For the first time in his adult life, the detective decides he doesn't want to sleep in the dark. All those shapes in the blackness put him on edge. He thinks that a good night's sleep will probably have him right as rain by tomorrow morning. Everything passes eventually. As his mind drifts and his eyes begin to flutter closed, he starts to wonder if he always left that bathroom door open or whether it started to open very slowly as soon as his head hit the pillow. Sure enough, he wakes up gasping. Long, cold fingers, abnormally long in fact and oh, cold as shit. death, have closed around his throat. He's gasping in vain for breath as the hand clamps tighter. His eyes jolt open and he sees it again, that tall, thin oh, monster geez. lingering over him, strangling him. Its face is split into a wide, sadistic, tooth-bearing grin. Or something so thin, it's impossibly strong. The detective can't move, he can't scream, he can't do anything. But as he slips from sleep to true wakefulness, the monster is gone. It wafts out of the room with all the ease of a gust of wind. He sits up, heart pounding, lungs strained, skin slick with sweat. He's never been so afraid in his life. He's been calmer during the active shootouts of his beat days all those years ago. The thing that was strangling him, it looked exactly the same as the monster from the reflection. They weren't just similar, it was the exactly same. the same thing. But what is it? Is he being stalked? Then it dawns on him. Another fragment of information swimming in the mess of his consciousness. An article he'd read a couple years before about a phenomenon known as sleep paralysis. It's when people suddenly wake up during REM sleep. Their body remains paralyzed while their consciousness activates, giving them one foot in reality while leaving the other in a nightmare. In this state, people can believe they're being attacked by monsters or demons. And one of the major factors causing sleep paralysis? Oh, jeez. Stress. The detective sighs. He feels like an idiot. There's nothing he's experienced today that doesn't have a completely logical explanation. So why does he keep jumping to such absurd conclusions? Twisting facts to suit theories rather than theories to suit facts. That being said, he still doesn't sleep another wink that night. He pours himself a few cups of coffee, subconsciously avoiding anything reflective, and sits in bed until sunrise, just watching his bedroom door. He's doing exactly what the man did. He keeps repeating in the empty corridors of his addled brain. He drives to work the next morning like he always does. Sitting at a stoplight, a car pulls up next to him, and he catches something in the reflection of the car's window. It's that monster again, sitting next to him, reaching out towards him with one of its huge hands. The detective gasps and spins around, his eyes flaring with panic. But of course, <laughs> it isn't there. Just some children on the sidewalk on their way to school. Maybe it's the fear, maybe it's the sleep deprivation, maybe it's both. But in that moment, he feels like crying. Little does he know, things are going to get so much worse. Yeah, Over the following days, the frequency of the sightings increases. Anytime he finds his eyes meeting a reflective surface, that monster is there, approaching him. But of course, it runs away before he can ever look at it head on. The people at work keep giving him funny looks. He grits his teeth. He can't say anything. If he tells anyone what's been happening to him, they'll haul him off to the funny farm to spend the rest of his life in a padded cell. But he knows he's not crazy. It's too real to be the product of human insanity. This isn't some hallucination. That thing is really there. It's always waiting, always watching. You're never Even gonna be able to get away from it. it. He can feel its eyes on him, sense its malicious intent. It's even worse at night. Every time he tries to sleep, it attacks him. He feels its hand clasping around his throat. He feels its bald fists pummeling his body. He feels its long fingernails scratching into his skin. He can't sleep anymore. He's too scared. And that too takes its toll. Every feeling, sleep every emotion, every thought starts He's to gonna end up exactly like quality, the man. Like nothing is quite real. Like the he farmer. starts to subsist on coffee, energy drinks, and anything else that will give him a buzz of alertness. He started to carry his service pistol around with him everywhere. He hides it under his pillow at night. He can never be too careful. He knows that the creature is always out there, always watching, always waiting. He knows on some level that it won't stop until it has taken everything from him. 
He's taking the subway to work again. He's messy, disoriented. His clothes stink. His bloodshot eyes are couched in unsightly bags. He shivers slightly, a nervous twitch. Put simply, he's not the man he used to be. He can't drive anymore. His nerves are too wrecked, and he has to take the bus to and from work. That's when he sees it, not behind him this time, but on the other side of the street as he waits for his bus. It stands among the other pedestrians, all seemingly oblivious to its presence. It just smiles, mocking him. This time, the detective is ready. The detective won't have it. In a single fluid motion, he unholsters his pistol and begins firing at the creature. The street erupts into screams as people scatter Oof. to avoid the frantic volley of gunshots. Just killing a bunch the of people. The creature doesn't move. It just keeps grinning as the detective fires, the rage and sleep deprivation throwing off his aim. He hears the sound of the bell again, its toll rising, its deafening. He needs to kill it. He needs to get closer. The detective walks toward the creature, firing bullet after bullet. The creature doesn't care. He roars in animal fury. The bell toll rises. A sudden light illuminates the creature's terrible smile. As the oh, detective he's, realizes he's about to get the hit. sound he's hearing isn't the toll of the bell at all. He turns just in time to see the bus, but not in enough time to get out of the way. The cowbell the detective found in the barn that day oh. seemed innocuous enough, but this old cowbell, corroded and covered in rust, which no no I had a feeling he was gonna die by the end of this. It's always like the ones that I like the most, like ones that killed get killed off the most. Except for that shopkeep who ate the gum. He survived, thankfully. <laughs> but um no, not this guy. I really liked him. So, R.I.P. Detective. Hopefully you will be avenged. Known methods, chemical or mechanical, seem to be able to remove, would soon have a name. SCP-513. It was discovered by an SCP Foundation agent during containment reestablished procedure Mu at a classified containment site, where its interior was covered in duct tape to prevent it from properly making a sound. There was also a paper note attached, reading, You've seen it. Now he can hear you. You've touched it. Now he can see you. Never ring it. If you hear it, he can touch you. And this is a warning worth heeding, because yeah. ringing SCP-513 invariably results in death. The question is just how much mental and physical anguish it puts its victim through before that endpoint. When the bell is first rung, anyone within earshot will begin to experience extreme anxiety, including physical symptoms such as heightened heart rate and raised blood pressure. They will also report feelings of dread and may claim that they can feel themselves being watched. Within about an hour, this worry is confirmed. SCP-513-1 is the less than charming creature hounding the unfortunate bell ringer and will begin to stalk the affected individuals. It will appear to approach individuals from behind, but quickly disappear if ever the subject attempts direct visual contact. It will also stage non-lethal physical attacks on its victims during their sleep in order to induce greater levels of psychological terror, though it disappears quickly upon waking. The stalking threat will only elevate over time, leading to increased psychological disarray for the victim. SCP-513-1 will eventually induce paranoia, aggression, hypervigilance, and depression, ending in a distressing and violent death. Because of the immense Ugh. danger posed to anyone who hears the Is sound of this cowbell tolling, SCP-513 has been given extensive containment precautions, extensive enough to warrant giving it the Euclid oh, containment class, damn it. classification reserved for things that are often unpredictable in containment. SCP-513 is suspended in a one cubic meter block of gelatin and contained within a soundproof, climate-controlled cell. The okay. gelatin is inspected daily for any degradation or loss of integrity. An emergency inspection is carried out immediately following any earthquake, explosion, or sonic event grade two or higher. Personnel performing the inspection wear earplugs and active noise-canceling earmuffs at all times while inside SCP-513's cell to avoid any kind of accidental exposure. If the gelatin cube shows any signs of degradation, such as rips, tears, splits, liquefaction, or mold, SCP-513 will be immediately removed and suspended within a replacement cube by a team of surgically deafened Class D personnel. Surgically deafened? No other personnel are to enter the cell during this procedure. Any sentient beings exposed to SCP-513 are to be monitored by at least two security personnel at all times. Under absolutely no circumstances may exposure victims be administered sedatives or allowed to fall unconscious. Any victim who does fall unconscious is to be terminated immediately. Class I, D personnel are to be terminated at the first sign of mental degradation. 
all other exposure victims may be terminated at their request. If possible, SCP-513-1 is to be apprehended on site, but sadly, the Foundation hasn't managed to get their hands on this unpleasant creature yet. But be careful ringing any mysterious old bells you find, or else he might just get his hands on you. Yeah. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-4... Okay, now I have an explanation as to why I saw, like, eight years ago. <laughs> um, I saw it from an older YouTuber who no longer is on the internet years ago. So that was my first ever exposure to SCP-513. And this was before I fully started getting into the SCP universe or really knew a lot mo of it to really get into it. So this was, I think this was one of the very few first SCPs I ever heard of growing up before fully getting into the SCP universe. So golf clap because it's late at night when I'm recording this. <laughs> but um, yeah, so Dr. Bob, you do not disappoint, but you did kill my, my new favorite detective out of all the ones we've seen so far. So why? But you were... Glad enough to let the shopkeeper of the candy store to live for me. So, thank you for that. And I will see more SCP content in the future as we are full blown back into the SCP stuff. And the playlist I have for watching all these videos has increased by an additional 30 videos. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so, half my content right now is going to be SCP stuff and whatever else comes along. So... Look forward to that, guys. With that being said, we're going to go ahead and end this video. So if you guys enjoyed today's reactive video, please like, comment, subscribe. And if you guys want uh, me to check out other SCP stuff, send it to me. Check the playlist to see what I've reacted to and send to me something I have not reacted to. And if you get, guys have friends who like watching SCP-related content, send this to your friends. Go right ahead. But um, with that being said, hopefully you guys enjoyed today's reaction video, and I will see you all in the next video. Bye.